welcome to worship today at Zion. It's uh, good that we can be here. I fielded a number of phone calls, so for any of you who might have called to uh, see if there's church today, glad you're here. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day. Take uh, some time, please, to look through the announcements in the bulletin. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is the blood drive coming up here on uh, January 17th. Uh, there is information um, there and more information will be available later. Um, also, our annual meeting is coming up at the very end of January, so please make note of that. Um, that Sunday on the 20, what is it, 6th, 26th, there will be just the one service at 8.30, and then the annual meeting will follow that. So uh, otherwise, take uh, time to look through those announcements. Our first hymn today, we are singing verses 1 and 4 of hymn number 308, hymn, uh, verses 1 and 4. Would you please stand as we sing our opening hymn? as we confess our sins and we receive the Lord's forgiveness. Page 94 in the front portion of our hymnal. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. 
And we offer our prayer of the day. It is printed in your worship folder. Let us pray. God of all people, you called many by name, asking them to follow Jesus and obey. Call us by name and help us to follow and obey. Amen. You may be seated. The uh, scripture readings for today, we continue our journey through the Gospel of John with the first chapter, verses 35 through 51. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard uh, what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And then he added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The psalm for today is from uh, Psalm 66, verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, How awesome are your deeds! So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for humankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They pass through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. with a 
I've got some, uh, I've got some pictures here I want to show you. But first, I want to ask you, have you ever heard of Google Earth? Google Earth. No. All right. OK. This is what Google Earth will do. It starts out with satellite pictures. Everybody, if you haven't seen it, this is pretty amazing. And you can go anywhere in the world. OK. So this is Google Earth. And then I just go, I go click, click. And then it zooms in. You know what this is? That's North America and part of South America. And then it goes zoom, it goes in, and there's all of North America. Now, do you know about where we live in this picture? Wisconsin is right here. So I go click, click, and it zooms in on, there's the state of Wisconsin. And there's Lake Michigan and Lake Superior up here. And do you know about where we live in Wisconsin? Right over here. So I go click, click, like that. And it zooms in. And here is Baldwin. This is like a picture from the air. And here's Woodville. This is, this is where our church is. That's where I live. Where do you guys live? In Baldwin. So you live somewhere over here, Baldwin, Wisconsin. And then I'm going to show you two more places, two other places on the earth. This is right on the shore of Lake Superior. And right in here, can you see a tiny little white dot there? That is called the Baptism Falls. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. One of my favorite places on Earth. And this little dark line here, that's a river. Do you see that? That's a river that goes right into Lake Superior. Now I'm going to show you a picture of another river right here. This is the Colorado River. See where it kind of winds through here? And this is a part of the earth that's called the Grand Canyon. Have you ever heard of that? No? I've heard of it, but I've never been there. Now, if I'm ever going to the Baptism Falls again, I'm going to kind of know what it looks like because I've been there before, right? Have you ever been someplace and you wanted to go back again? Yeah, that's kind of like this. Now, I've never been here, so I can, I can see pictures of the Grand Canyon, and people can tell me about the Grand Canyon, but I've never been there, so I don't really kind of know what to expect. Today we hear that the disciples were meeting Jesus, and they were going to go places that they had never been. They had no idea where Jesus was going to lead them. Um, but we meet Jesus in different places. We meet Jesus here at church in Sunday school, um, other places at home, you meet Jesus when you pray together. Uh, this is very important for us to think about with that where we meet Jesus in our lives. And he promises that he will always show us the better way. He will show us the way to live. Let's take a moment to pray, okay? Thank you, Jesus, for your great, great love for us. Um, there are times that we don't know where we are going, but you have promised that you would go there with us and that, in fact, you would lead the way. So we place our lives into your hands today, Jesus, and every day of our lives, we trust you, we love you, we know that you love us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, and I'll see you later. So the Grand Canyon. I've heard people describe the grandness of the Grand Canyon. There's a reason why it's called Grand, I guess. I have heard people describe the incomparable heights and depths of the fjords in Norway. I have heard people describe London's breathtaking St. Paul's Cathedral. You know, where the kings and queens get married and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, honestly, it didn't take my breath away. I don't know. Um, neither did the Grand Canyon, nor the fjords of Norway. 
And I think I know why these sites, they're so amazing to so many people, but to me, hmm, not so much. I think the reason they don't really impress me is because I have never been there. I've never actually seen any of those places with my own eyes. But I do get a sense of those grand, incomparable, breathtaking places because there is a place for me that does some of those very same things. And that is the North Shore of Lake Superior. To me, just amazing, grand, and breathtaking. It's a place where I went as a child and we've returned numerous times over the course of years. We have seen Lake Superior from the shore. We have seen Lake Superior from the water. We have been on the Shawamigan Bay and around the Apostle Islands. We have camped and hiked. I've taken pictures and we have driven along the shoreline. I've skipped stones on Lake Superior and even taken a dip in the super cold waters of the uh, the Ojibwe Gichigami, the native's great sea, the greatest of the Great Lakes. And if I wanted to explain the vastness of this, I cannot describe it. And if I wanted to show you a picture, I could, but that would seem kind of silly. In fact, I have taken pictures of Lake Superior, but it just all sort of fades off into a, a grayish haze, and none of those photos can really tell you what can be seen by the naked eye. You have to see it to know it. I would guess that what others have tried to tell me of the Grand Canyon, or the Hardanger Fjord, or uh, London St. Paul Cathedral would all have a much greater impact on me if I had ever been to one of those places as they are trying to describe the indescribable then I could close my eyes and go to that place that is so important to so many people then it would be real, well it is real, but it would seem more real to me. It would be a part of me. I would know and share the amazement and the glory. I think that might be what the disciples were trying to do in this gospel reading from John chapter 1 that we just heard moments ago. They were trying to describe the indescribable. We've already had a glimpse of that in this first chapter of John over the last couple of Sundays where Jesus is described as being the light. Jesus is described as being the word. Jesus is truth and grace and today we're given another image. Jesus is the lamb and none of those descriptions are adequate. They just don't quite explain the unexplainable. We see that after each disciple has met Jesus, he tried with his own inadequate words to describe the indescribable. So with each, the last ditch effort is come and see. I can just about hear them now saying, I, I can't explain it. Just, just come and see. There was something visual that made all the difference. And throughout this Bible reading, we are told to come and see. This really kind of amazed me as we look through this. You can do this on your own. Go through it sometime and just circle or underline or highlight or just notice, point at all the words that have to do with seeing. John 1.35, John the Baptist saw Jesus. Verse 38, Jesus saw John's disciples. Verse 39, Jesus said to John's disciples, come and see. Verse 42, Jesus looked at Simon. Verse 46, Philip said to Nathanael, come and see. 
Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael. Verse 48, Jesus had seen Nathanael earlier. Verse 50, Jesus said, I saw you. Verse 50, again, you will see greater things. In verse 51, you will see heaven open. As we read the Gospel of John over these next months, I'm thinking that John is going to hit us over the head with might seem like the obvious. With incredible redundancy, he is going to show us things that are of life-changing value. And perhaps as we open our eyes to see the gospel and open our hearts and minds, we truly will see who Jesus is and how what we see makes an eternal difference in our lives. So if seeing Jesus was an important way for the disciples to come to belief, how do we see Jesus today? Perhaps the gospel reading can help us to see Jesus again. There are those who, like the disciples of John, who actually were looking for Jesus. We see this in verses 35 through 39. They had sort of always been looking for him. They knew that something special was coming, the Messiah they were looking for. And like those of us who have always known Jesus, and we can't think of a time when Jesus was not a part of the mix of our lives, we learn from the rabbi, the teacher. We learn in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and worship and Bible study times and even in our family times of praying together, we are learning about Jesus and we learn by doing. We learn by practicing our faith. Now perhaps you have already always believed, but in John chapter 1, we see these people following Jesus and they wanted to know more. So Jesus turns around. Um, this is not a case of somebody really pursuing Jesus so much as Jesus just turning around, looking them right in the eye, saying, what do you want? Oh, <laughs> we want to know where you're staying. That's an interesting word in the Greek, staying. It's not, it's not like saying, where's your house, Jesus, or where's your town, or who are your friends. It's not like hanging out with Jesus on a Sunday morning. Where are you staying, Jesus? The word is meno, and that is a word that means permanent kind of staying. This is a desire to always be with Jesus, always. Not just hanging out with Jesus on Sunday morning. This is much deeper. And some people, some of you have known that hunger to have known Jesus in a more permanent way, everyday relationship with Jesus, all the time kind of relationship with Jesus as the Christ. That is the kind of relationship that we see reflected here in these first verses, 35 through 39. We move through this gospel reading, verses 40 through 42, we see a different kind of relationship here how one person who loves Jesus actually shares that love of Jesus with his brother. The brother is Simon, who became Peter, a rock of faith, yet a very fragile person of faith too. We see Peter's life of faith develop as we go through these Gospels and into the book of Acts. But it was the sharing of a brother who said, I want you to know Jesus too. That's what changed Peter's life. Perhaps someone introduced you to Jesus. Perhaps someone invited you to be a part of a family of faith. And that invitation, as simple as that invitation was, 
it changed your life. Then in verses 43 through 49, we see Jesus heading out on his own. Now Jesus is the one looking, and he finds Philip. Jesus comes right up to Philip. Philip's journey of faith is a different kind of journey of faith because it does not start out with an introduction from a brother or a friend. And in fact, Philip was not really looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him. Jesus found Philip. I don't know anything about the personality of Philip, but I do know people who are kind of like Philip, who have never really looked for a life of faith. They didn't really start out looking for Jesus. And they were not looking for religion. They were not looking for a change of life. Things were fine just as they were. But Jesus came to them. And it might have been during a time of life change. Perhaps it was during a time of just regular living or business or whatever. But Jesus came down the road. Jesus is the one who opened the door. Jesus is the one who initiated the response or the contact with Philip. He walked right up to him, and then Philip saw Jesus. He had never seen him before. But the story of Philip could not be told now without involving Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is a completely different story. (laughs) Nathaniel was not easily impressed. In fact, Nathaniel had already made up his mind that Jesus was worthless even before he met him. He prejudged him. That's prejudice. Jesus, a no-gooder from Nazareth because in Nathaniel's opinion, nobody from Nazareth was worth anything. Nathaniel reminds me of the person who really has no time for Jesus, none at all. He has no time for church. He has no time for organized religion, whatever that means. <laughs> That's a phrase that puzzles me, but Nathaniel had no time for that. All he has seen of Christians is a bunch of hypocrites. Nathaniel could not think of one good thing that ever came out of Nazareth, and that, of course, includes Jesus. They're all the same, is what he thought, and there are people who can see no good things coming out of church, right? There are people who can see no good things coming from Christians and looking at Jesus is just not what they are going to be doing because they've seen enough. That is Nathaniel. He was not open to meeting Jesus. He had seen enough. But Jesus approached him too. (laughs) And Jesus spoke to him and he said that he had seen Nathaniel under a tree. Now this, I have no idea what to make of this. I I don't get this at all. It seems rather ridiculous to me, but this one comment is what changed Nathaniel's idea about Jesus. Jesus said, I saw you under a tree. And that is something that impressed Nathaniel. Nathaniel came to believe, and and I don't know what it is. Maybe it is that Nathaniel just saw Jesus as being so normal, Um, not a crazed religious nut. He talked about a tree. I I don't know (laughs) what to make of that. Perhaps you can think that over and share your thoughts with me. But Jesus does tell Nathanael, uh, and Jesus tells us, very simply, that we are going to see much greater things than that. 
Whether we have always wanted to see Jesus or whether we have never wanted to see Jesus or have seen some of Jesus' people at work and just think that we have seen enough, we see all of these people in this gospel reading today. And you and I are a part of this story too. We are in these words of this scripture. And Jesus comes to us either through a friend or through an open heart or conversation, or Jesus comes to you maybe on his own terms. But Jesus does become a part of every one of our lives. Maybe Jesus has always been there. Maybe some of you, some of us, just don't always see Jesus. As Jesus calls his disciples, he calls us too. And he calls every one of us by name. We are called into, into discipleship through holy baptism. And as the years go by, some are going to lose track of Jesus. I know that. But I also know that Jesus will never lose track of us. Jesus calls and he calls and he calls every one of us by name our whole life through. Today our Sunday school kids are going to begin a study of baptism. And next Sunday I'm meeting with our fourth grade uh, students and parents and we are going to be talking about baptism and many of these children that are in this class were baptized here. Some were baptized elsewhere and I'm not sure but I'm guessing there might be some who have not yet been baptized. But we are going to talk about this as a great, great gift of God. The greatest gift that we will ever receive in this life. Jesus calls us by name so that we can see Jesus too. To follow Jesus, to be his disciples, we are all called into this holy vocation of faith. And our prayer today is that we can see where Jesus is leading the way. Amen. We sing a, a song of baptism, a song of being called, number 442, verses 1 through 4. Notice that some of you were not fooled and, and you did not sing verses 3 and 4. Um, we do confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we ask our ushers to wait upon us for our offering for today. gift of grace as we receive Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. He broke it and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. We pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we receive Holy Communion uh, today, uh, hymns that may be sung are printed in the worship, uh, are listed in the worship folder. Uh, also, those who abstain from alcohol, the center ring of each tray is prepared for you, and our Holy Communion is prepared. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ.
This is the Bible. Gracious Lord, you have given us a good, good message of good news that does change who we are and changes our lives and changes the world for the better. We carry this message of salvation with us wherever we go. And so we ask that you would help us to find ways that we might be able to share that with the people around us. If we do it as the disciples did uh, with family members or friends, or if we just wait for you to come to us, help us to wait with open eyes, with open hearts and open minds. Bless us always, Lord, that we may be a blessing to uh, those around us and who are those who are a part of our lives. 
And uh, we ask that you would uh, lead us and that we would see the way where you are leading. We take a moment for our own silent prayers at this time. We thank you too, Lord, for this gift of Holy Communion that you have given your life for us. Help us to give our lives to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand as we receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We go in peace now to serve the, uh, the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our final hymn, uh, Joy to the World, number 267. of his love and wonders of his love